Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jason DeFalco, Superintendent of Blackstone Millville Regional School District. I'm Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. And thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is the first time that we've tried this venue, but um, as uh, most of you know, or anybody who's watching, the uh, engagement side of our work is really important with the community and making sure that everybody's plugged into the great work that's going on here in BMR. And so uh, we're super happy to have you join us this afternoon, and we really hope that we have a, a, a decent turnout. And we've got some good questions. There actually are some questions already coming in. and. Um, you know, if, if, any, uh, if anything, we're, we're being as creative as possible to try to reach as many families and community members as we can to really have an open dialogue about the work that we're doing in BMR to improve uh, teaching every single day and learning every single day for our students. And so uh, we do have a couple of questions already, but we're going to just pause those for a minute because we do want to talk a little bit about where we are uh, in our budget cycle. And so uh, we have a very brief overview of some of the work that's uh, been done and we're going to talk a little bit about what's in our budget and um, a little bit about the impact on our two communities and uh, then of course open up for uh, questions and we'll we'll certainly address the questions that have already been posted uh, although they're not necessarily budget related I do think there is clearly an impact there but we certainly would encourage uh, all and any questions to be asked as we as we move along in the next 30 minutes uh, and so with that, uh, we're going to start by taking a look at uh, slide two on our uh, brief presentation here. And this is just an overview of our district improvement strategy. And uh, for those of you who have been following the work of the school department this past year, this is a, a graphic that is all too familiar uh, to you. Um, but you'll notice that in the core of this graphic at the center of our work is improving outcomes for all kids. And we are deeply committed to that. Uh, in every single classroom, in every single day for every student. And in order for us to help um, meet that goal, we are looking at strengthening our curriculum. That's what we teach in terms of materials, resources, um, and making sure that we are aligned to the state standards so that we're teaching the kids the right stuff. We're also looking at our work with instruction. That's how we teach. And so that's really looking at ensuring we are using our best practices for instruction with kids and really teaching the way kids learn. So we're working on the what, and we're working on the how, which is the delivery. Um, and the last two pieces of our uh, district improvement strategy are really anchored around the, the, the child and the community. And so that third strategy is focused on removing what we call those non-academic barriers that can get in the way of our students' learning. Um, and uh, case in point with our uh, Facebook Live uh, stream today, trying to engage the community in this really important work. Um, we believe uh, strongly that the schools are the lifeblood of every community, and, and BMR is no different. And so we're very committed to working with our community to make sure that we are providing the best education possible. I open our conversation this afternoon with this graphic because um, although this is a budget conversation, we've also shared repeatedly that uh, all uh, financial resources, all dollars, are anchored to our goals and objectives for our improvement work. And so you're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, and with that, if we take a look at slide three, you will see uh, just a couple of headlines, if you will, around what's in the budget. So these are some of the, the new pieces that you will see in the uh, fiscal 20 budget for uh, next school year. Um, you will notice that we have added two additional classroom teachers those classroom teachers are for the JFK AFM complex. Uh, in grades two and four, um, our, our families uh, tuning in or teachers tuning in from grades two and four at uh, the complex know our classes are in the higher 20s, lower 30s. And that's just simply too big, and we know that. And so uh, we have been very committed to bringing those class sizes down and providing direct support to students and, of course, to the teachers that are doing the good work every day and teaching second and fourth grade of the complex. So um, we have added in this budget two additional teachers uh, for the complex to bring those numbers down. Uh, you will also see the addition of two instructional coaches. And those coaches are really in place to partner side by side with teachers to help develop really strong lesson plans for the kids sitting in front of them each and every day and to help the teachers really unpack the student work to assess students' strengths and students' opportunities for improvement 
and then to plan the so what now what, what comes next as a result of that. Um, you'll note that it, that it mentions there's no additional resources attached to that and that's because uh, we were able to do quite a bit of um, redesign work with our budget over this year and add those two positions um, by simply realigning uh, money that we already had and putting it uh, behind the two coaching positions instead of, of, of having it in other, in other places. Uh, you will also notice some work around literacy and uh, making sure that we have a cutting edge literacy uh, program and that we have the staff development necessary for our teachers and resources for our kids to make sure that all kids are reading on grade level by third grade. We know that eight is too late. So we are hitting that target for a third grade, um, that third grade literacy benchmark. Uh, this year, you, you might uh, remember that we've been going through this process with science so that we will again have a cutting edge, hands-on, um, uh, state-of-the-art science program for our students, all aligned to the next generation science standards. Uh, and the last two items, again, are focused around literacy. Uh, leveled libraries for students, making sure that they have more books in their hands that are uh, at their reading level and the supports that are necessary uh, for that. And then Wilson Reading is an intervention service for those students that really require uh, a, a much deeper level of support with reading. And so Mr. Aaronworth and I thought it would be very important to, before we kind of launch into the numbers, to really look at uh, some of the items that you will see in the actual budget. So with that, we're going to look at slide four, and Mr. Aaronworth is going to take us through our numbers. Certainly. So slide four indicates what the impact on the towns will be. Uh, we have the assessments for each of the towns, starting with Blackstone. You can see that the minimum local contribution, which is the amount that the state requires the town to pay, is about $6,596,000. The exclusionary costs, which include transportation for regular education and special education services, will be charged $1,146,000. And the additional monies above minimum local contribution and those transportation costs is $1,000,000. 417,000. The capital costs for Blackstone, which are for the roof improvements which were made sometime in the past uh, and some other capital endeavors, will cost $353,350 this year, bringing the Blackstone total assessment to $9,513,397. The Millville assessment has a minimum local contribution of $2,178,300, an exclusionary cost of $435,319, and above the minimum and exclusionary costs, the additional will run $538,179. The capital is $138,221, the capital expenses for both towns actually decreased this year due to the fact that we recently closed on one of the larger bonds that we had for sewer work that had been done. Uh, worth noting as well is the minimum local contribution portion. They are significantly higher than they have been in the past. Uh, the state has really been shifting the responsibility of paying for education back on to the local source, basically the towns. Um, the increase that Blackstone saw this year alone from last year's minimum local contribution is $278,000 that they were required to pay. Uh, Millville also saw an increase of their minimum local contribution of $104,000 that the state mandates the town pay. And so uh, with that, we think there might, have, there might be or may have been a little bit of confusion around, uh, in particular, the Blackstone assessment. Um, and so we know that there you know, is, is uh, quite a bit of discussion as of late around that. So we thought we would take an opportunity, uh, this opportunity, to, to unpack that a little bit. And so as Mr. Aaronworth just mentioned, um, the state has increased what is known as the minimum local contribution to each one of our communities. 
Um, and so, uh, again, uh, Mr. Aaronworth mentioned that Blackstone's uh, increased by $278,000 for next year. That is a number uh, that is assigned by the state. It is not uh, any request that has come um, from the school department to uh, either one of the communities, but in fact is, uh, you know, is being uh, handed down to us. And so we mentioned that up front because uh, the increase uh, to both communities, Blackstones in particular, is very misleading um, in that the $278,384 in that minimum local contribution was just assigned to us. Uh, we had no say in that matter. Another piece that uh, we think may have uh, caused a little bit of confusion uh, is this idea, uh, and you can see it on slide four, of something called exclusionary costs. And so you will notice that our exclusionary costs for the Blackstone assessment this year is uh, essentially $1.1 million. If you were to look at last year's, the FY19, or our current fiscal year, you would know that the exclusionary costs were $1.3 million. And so uh, what we uh, ended up doing, we didn't, ex we didn't reduce the exclusionary costs, but exclusionary costs, by definition, essentially is transportation. Uh, and there were items uh, in last, uh, during the last budget cycle for this current fiscal year that were in that exclusionary line that needed to be moved to the additional line, which is that line three underneath the Blackstone assessment. And so uh, a good way to think about that is taking that $200,000 that we had to move from exclusionary to additional. And if you look at that additional line of uh, basically 1.4 million, you can really back 200,000 out of that. Um, that's not new money, it's just money that we had to move from one line to another. Uh, so that's really important to note because when you look at the Blackstone uh, or the Millville assessment for that matter, it seems as though the increase of additional monies that has been requested um, seems very, very significant. And while we're not minimizing the fact that, that there, is, um, there is a large sum of money there, um, it is a little misleading because we simply moved $200,000 uh, from the exclusionary line to the additional line. Um, and I know there'll be some further conversation about that, uh, and we're looking forward to continuing to, to clear that up. But with all that being said, um, in order to implement the first phase of our district improvement plan, which on slide three uh, is outlines uh, some of those major components in terms of the uh, resources for teaching and learning and the additional teachers, um, that, that does come at, additional, uh, at an additional ask. And so uh, the real ask from the school department uh, to Blackstone is just over $300,000 additionally, uh, which is about a 3% increase. However, if you take that 3% increase and you add to it the 278000 that the state is now requiring us to pay in additional money in that minimum local contribution, that drives up that 3% to about 5.8%. Um, and so, you know, we thought it would be important to really put that out there and explain deeper um, why that increase looks uh, the way it does. And similarly for Millville. Um, Millville also had an increase um, in their additional line because we did adapt, ask for additional resources and because we did move um, uh, some items from the exclusionary line that should have been placed into the additional line. Again, that you see there on slide four. Um, and so, you know, we will continue to address any questions or concerns around this. Um, we've taken a really open and transparent approach to this budget. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. Um, our fiscal plan, we've been saying all along, needs to match our strategic plan uh, or our teaching and learning plan, which is that district strategy. And so we're really committed uh, to continuing these conversations to really make sure that everybody's on the same page uh, moving forward. Um, and so, um, you know, as you're watching, if you have questions about this particular issue, please do make sure that uh, you continue to ask those questions. And Mr. Aaronworth, you want to go over slide five? Slide five, coming to the final conclusion, indicates where we just went through the town assessments, 
we certainly want to make everyone aware that this is not the entirety of our budget. Uh, we have in state, federal, and additional revenues. Some of those revenues raised by our own fees, um, rental class, rental or cla classrooms. We have Medicaid reimbursements that we bring in, athletic user fees, music user fees. Those fees actually total almost three hundred fifty-five thousand um, dollars. That gets added to what it is that we've applied to the budget, and the total of the state, federal, and additional revenues is about $12 million, bringing our total between state, federal, and additional, and town contributions to $24,771,259. And if I may, uh, Mr. Aaron Worth, that is a 3% increase over last year. So I do think it's important to note, and, and we, we, we are so appreciative of the support from our two communities. Um, we know that um, the school budget is the largest percent or the largest part of any municipal budget um, in, in any community in the Commonwealth. We understand that and we very much respect and appreciate the support that we've received. Um, and while the Blackstone assessment is an increase of 5.8 percent and the Millville assessment is an increase of 6.1 percent, um, it's actually an overall increase on our school department budget by 3 percent. And so if you think about where we were last year at this time, um, the school department was going through a very difficult process um, of looking at staffing and, and really having some, some deep conversations about where we needed to reduce staffing, um, you know, what programs or resources could we reduce or eliminate. Um, we're really happy that we are not in that situation right now. We hope, um, we, you know, like I said, I, I know, <clears throat> um, We've got some more work to do, um, and uh, we know that Blackstone has put a number forward that is, um, that is a bit less than, uh, about $300,000 less than what we had initially requested, but uh, you know, we continue to, to put the information out there and to clarify and are certainly hopeful that that will shift. Um, and then one other piece before we jump to questions, and, and we're really thankful we've got quite a few to delve into, uh, just wanna share um, and, and I know Ms. Aaronworth got into this a little bit. The overall percentages, do you want to talk a little bit about the overall percentages of where our budget actually comes from in terms of the state and each of the communities? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I mentioned the numbers, but 48.3% of the budget comes from state and federal and other funds. 38.4% comes from Blackstone's assessment and 13.3% comes from Millville's assessment. I also wanted to mention, uh, before we jump into the questions, we'll have time to answer some of these questions, but people may not be aware, there is also a library of videos that detail the entire budget process that is available on our YouTube channel. And some of the questions that you may have that may not be answered during this session, you can certainly find out more information through watching those videos. And on our district homepage, you'll find a budget video uh, that Ms. Aaronworth and I did explaining the entire process, mm -hmm. how we settled on uh, the 24.7 million, um, what the uh, assessments to each of the communities are. And so you'll hear some, some, of, the, some of the similar information um, but um, it does allow you to, to kind of toggle back and forth and to, you know, if you're curious about something, you can replay and re-listen and that kind of thing. So good point of bringing those up. Um, ready to shift into Absolutely. questions? Okay, so um, we've got a, a, quite a few questions here, and I wanna, we want to go to the f question around budget first, just because we're on that topic. Um, Colleen uh, wrote in and asked, um, if Blackstone doesn't fund the full proposed budget, uh, will that affect the two additional teachers at the complex? And so um, here's the challenge. So if Blackstone comes in uh, with the uh, certified budget that we put forward um, at the $295,000 less than what we asked for, that means that Millville, uh, they have to change their number, and that number will change by 112000 so when you take the 295,000 from Blackstone and you match that with 112,000 from Millville, 
that totals about $407,000. Those are significant reductions in services. Um, and so while, you know, we are, while we're not committed to saying exactly what would go, uh, if we have to make a reduction of $407,000, we are certainly hoping we don't have to do that. Um, I think at this point, we would have to discuss all possibilities. However, uh, we are fully committed to making sure that uh, we insulate the students as much as we can and minimize the impact, but it's inevitable. When you're reducing services by $407,000, there's going to be an impact on, on teachers and students. The largest, the largest percentage of our entire budget is salaries and benefits. So as Dr. DeFalco mentioned, while we want to have the least impact possible on student learning, inevitably I would imagine that there will be uh, changes that need to be made with the configuration of our teaching. And so uh, along similar, and Colleen, we hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, write back and ask us to clarify um, or, or go further if you need us to. Um, Jen asks um, that while we were talking about slide three specifically, which is what you would see uh, in our proposed budget, um, what is the literacy program? And so a couple things. So right now, um, we at the elementary level um, are using something called balanced literacy. And so uh, essentially we have um, kind of units of instruction written and developed um, to a certain degree for our uh, teachers and kids. However, um, not all the units are completely developed. The teachers have not had all of the training and support they need. and we don't, unfortunately, we don't have all the resources uh, necessary to implement that with fidelity. And so um, what we are going to be doing next year, again, should the budget go through, is actually working, uh, as we did with science this year, with a uh, group of teachers that are interested in, in writing uh, curriculum uh, across the district, K to 12. And uh, we will be writing our units of instruction, so the, you know, the units that will be taught to our kids around literacy specifically, um, and then implementing various uh, literacy models, piloting various literacy models and resources like we're doing with science now, surveying the teachers and students for feedback like we'll be doing with our um, science uh, pilot at the end of May, which is coming up quick, um, and then putting together a real comprehensive um, literacy program for the district. Um, if Jen, if you're asking, you know, what is the what is the Wilson reading piece of that? I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure if that's what you're asking, but Wilson reading is a phonetic based phonics based program. Uh, and phonics is just the smallest unit of sound. So it's when we when we sound out words, it's, um, you know, the vowel uh, vowel sounds or vowel consonant E sounds or consonant blends like TH. Um, so basically, it's the smallest unit of sound, and it's teaching students in a very systemic way how to sound out words by um, tapping out syllables and learning the different rules for, for that. Um, do sure. You Armand's questions? Armand asked, where do we stand with regionalization at the elementary levels? And would regionalization of the elementary students benefit us in any way as far as state funding is concerned? So to answer that question, we are in the process of evaluating our regional agreement. Um, first and foremost, there is a number of, there are a number of sections in it that the language is simply outdated. Um, it does not reflect current legal standards and it doesn't reflect currently um, some of the practices in the district. So we are working, well, we have just engaged uh, very recently a uh, consulting group to help drive this work forward. There is a committee that has been formed with uh, school committee members and town members and members of the town governments. And we will be looking at the regional agreement and deciding what changes need to be made, specifically regarding the regionalization of the elementary schools I can't say for sure that that will be an outcome, but that will certainly be something that is discussed during these committee meetings and something that has potential. Uh, regarding the funding, uh, I will say that 
there would not be any additional state funding due to regionalizing the elementary schools. Um, I think any kind of additions that we got with respect to funding would come from freeing up the availability to better use our resources and shift where we have the district resources across buildings and um, just be more efficient. So that potentially could result in some savings, but there would not be any additional funding from the state. And just to add uh, something that uh, to what uh, Mr. Aaronworth mentioned, the, the idea of the regionalization. So we are a regional K-12 district already, um, but we do need to make sure uh, that you know our regional agreement is up to date because there are quite a few places that are uh, that are that are not current. Um, and it's really important to understand that the regional agreement is a governing document, um, and. It doesn't necessarily get into, you know, kind of into the weeds of what kids are where, uh, so to speak. Um, but we, we know how important of an issue that is. We understand that completely. Um, and, you know, could there be some consolidation of services? Should we be able to get the elementary schools together? Um, you know, our general sense is, is yes. But I think to, to Matt's point, you know, regarding uh, any state increase, you know, we don't see it, that, that happening from that. From that piece of work. Yeah. Armand also asked uh, where do we stand as far as capacity as a district and at each level. Um, I know that we can say that we are certainly not at capacity as a district with respect to the building space that we have. Millville is very much under capacity. I believe the building was built for approximately 600. 600 students and we a lot of the rooms are currently empty. Um, We're at 272. 272. For student enrollment at Millville. We also are uh, not at capacity at the AFM JFK complex. Right, um, and so our current enrollment is about 580, uh, and we do have some additional classroom space, uh, more so on the JFK side of the, of the complex as well. Um, and I, I apologize because I also failed to mention the middle school, middle school. Yeah. <laughs> is also under capacity. Um, I'm not the number of students we're at the we're about school. 420 at the middle school, 420 students, uh, and we have, if you were to combine the empty classrooms uh, together, we have about a floor uh, worth of uh, of empty space. Um, and so, look, I think I think here's kind of the bottom line with this: we need to be in this work together. Um, we need to work collaboratively. We need to be a unified front from administration to the teachers to students uh, to the student support staff to the families um, and you know that's why um, the community focus is one of our four pillars of our district improvement strategy we have got to come together around our kids and around our schools and so um, you know until we're able to do that until we're able to really get on the same page and continue the improvement work um, at, a, at a more accelerate, accelerated rate that we have started, we'll see numbers where they are. Right now, uh, today our enrollment is right around 1,700. Um, or I th actually, I think we're uh, 1,701 students. Uh, but the projections moving forward, we're going to be under that. We're going to be under 1,700. Um, and I will say um, we really need to come together and work collaboratively to be part of this solution uh, for the improvement work that we've laid, on, laid out in front of us. And so, Armand, we've, we've got, we have space. We have, we have real estate to expand mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, Kim uh, wrote in and asked, what is the maximum number of students that an elementary classroom can have? And so um, that's an interesting question because there, there's a lot of ways to answer it. And so there's what's, what's best practice there which we'll talk about that there's what does the research say about class size and then does the state have any uh, input on this matter and so from the state perspective the answer is no uh, they have no input on class size they have they, they don't weigh in on it they don't have any recommendations they don't have any guidelines um, that is a local decision that they stay out of um, although in a district review they will note that in their, you know, in their reports, but they, but they don't have any recommendations on that unless you get into special education and such. Um, as far as class size from a research perspective, 
Um, and as a parent, I, I say this a little like, you know, kind of begrudgingly because I, I get it. Uh, but from a research perspective, class size has shown it really doesn't impact learning until you get between 32 and 35 plus. Um, however, um, we know that that is not best practice. Best practice is um, keeping classes between 22 and, and 26 kids. And we were just delivered the notice that says <laughs> we're at 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Um, so I think that we want to thank everyone for joining us and keeping in tune with what's happening with the district and paying attention and hopefully supporting everything that we are trying to do moving forward for our students in the district. Yeah, and to echo that, we can't do this work alone. Um, and nor can we and the school committee do it alone, nor can we and the school committee and the teachers do it alone or the student support staff. We need everybody. We all need to be on board. And so um, um, I, you know, just to echo what Ms. Aaronworth said, want to thank everybody for their time. We hope this venue worked. Um, we're not sure how many people tuned in yet, but uh, we will keep trying. And if you have other ideas or suggestions to engage with families, um, please do let us know. And we look forward to seeing you soon. So thanks so much. Thanks again.